All right. We carry on. Now in uh, Jesus, where we are in chapter 10, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And in chapter 10, verses 32 to 34, he again tells the disciples that he'll be condemned, flogged, and killed, and that he'll rise on the third day. And on the heels of that teaching, in 1035 to 45, James and John, they seek to gain rank over the other disciples by requesting that Jesus grant them the two premier positions in his glory. And in verse 40, where we ended last week, Jesus tells them, he says, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared. And as Jesus indicates elsewhere, for example, in Matthew chapter 20, the giving of special honors and privileges in the consummated kingdom is something that the Father will grant at his good pleasure. So granting the request of James and John is not his prerogative. And then you see that the the ten other apostles, they're indignant. When they hear that they hear about this attempt of James and John to gain a superior rank in the kingdom. And then Jesus in verses 42 to 44, he calls them together and he again teaches them that infatuation with status and rank and power and privilege, that that is a worldly perspective that is at odds with the spiritual perspective of the kingdom. As Mark Strauss comments, he says, the indication is of a leadership that is radically other-centered, focused on meeting the needs of others rather than controlling others to meet one's own needs. The values of the kingdom turn the world's system upside down. And nowhere is that better shown than in Jesus himself. As Strauss says, the ultimate act of servant leadership is the Son of Man's sacrificial death as a ransom payment for the sins of the world. I mean, here he is, God the Son, giving his life to bless and benefit other people. His death will pay the necessary price to set people free And as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And so you see this act of sacrificial service of God the Son. Now, in in 1046 to 52, they come to Jericho. Now, Jericho, just to remind you, you see Jericho here, if this little pointer works, Jericho is about six miles west of the Jordan River and about 14 miles east-northeast of Jerusalem. That's as the crow flies. But you don't get there as the crow flies. You get there more like this. And here you have a large thing you see up here is Nazareth, Capernaum. Jericho, see, you'll come down here and then you'll go up the mountains. You'll come to Bethany and there's the Mount of Olives. So that way it's significantly longer. But that's kind of a a general where we are in terms of of the geography. And they come to Jericho, and as Jesus is leaving the town with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar, who's known in Aramaic as Bartimaeus. And Mark explains that means son of Timaeus. So this is somebody who's known. Mark's writing this, and he's saying this is the son of Timaeus here. And he's sitting, by, he's sitting beside the road. Now in Luke chapter 18, verse 35, that, that verse is commonly understood as reporting that, uh, that this interaction occurred as Jesus was nearing Jericho rather than as he was leaving Jericho. Jericho. But Luke's text, it can be understood to mean when he was in the vicinity of Jericho. Now, if that's the correct understanding, then that tension in the accounts is resolved. So it can be understood that way. But when when he heard, when, when Bartimaeus heard 
that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Jesus was a very common name. And so when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth, that Jesus, was passing by, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And that phrase, the son of David, is a, is a, a term, a designation for the Messiah. You know, that God has promised he's going to put a descendant of David on the throne. And so he's calling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And many people in the crowd rebuked him. Now they did that, no doubt, thinking that he was too socially insignificant to bother the master. This, this blind beggar is sitting over here crying out for the Lord's attention. So they're all jumping on him and they're, they're rebuking him. But the man just cried out all the more. And you see this theme. You see, he wouldn't be put off. He wouldn't be bullied so that he would, be, he would stop his pursuit. No, like a rabid dog, he's chasing. You see, he, he doesn't care what they're saying about him. He is focused on what he understands, who he understands the Lord is and what he can do. And so he won't be put off. He understands a truth that will escape many of, of the Jewish religious leaders. So they're telling him, no, you know, uh, don't, don't bother him. You just sit over here and he won't have any of that. Then Jesus stops and he tells the people to call the blind man over to him. Well, they changed their tune then. You see, they're all over here. Yeah, you know, you just quit bothering the teacher. Jesus stops and says, call him over here. Oh, they go, they go running over there and, and they now say to him, they tell him, look, they say, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And then Bartimaeus, he tosses his cloak, he jumps up and he comes to Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? You see, what do you want me to do for you? He's asking this man, do you see me as a religious teacher who's somebody who will give generously to your plate or your cup? Do you see me as somebody who's going to be a good giver for your begging? Is that what you want from me? Do you want a nice donation? Or do you want something else? Do you recognize in me someone who's able to do the impossible? What do you want? And the man tells him, he says, he wants to receive his sight. Okay, well, that's, that's going out there, isn't it? Do you go out and ask somebody, say, listen, here, what do you want from me? What do you think I can provide you? I want to see. Okay, well, that says a lot. That says a lot about how you understand the son of David. How you understand Jesus. And Jesus dismisses him with a declaration that his faith has saved him. And immediately, his sight was restored. You see, this man, as many others that we've looked at, he persisted in his pursuit of Jesus despite the pressure not to do so. And I think about our world and our culture and how many people there are out there who are put off their pursuit of Jesus by a world that tells them that's just stupid, that's just superstitious. You have to be brain dead to think that stuff. We are the brights. We are the intelligentsia. We really know what's going on. So you don't want to be stupid and ignorant, you see. Uh, leave that for the toothless people on porch swings. You see, and so there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that pressure. And so people are turned away from their pursuit. But those who won't be turned away, who say, listen, I hear you, but hey, I'm going to pursue who he is they will be blessed. And I see that happening here with him. He's blessed. And having been healed, he follows Jesus along the road. And then traveling from Jericho, Jesus and the disciples, they arrive at Jerusalem's doorstep. They come to Jerusalem's doorstep, which is the vicinity of Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And here you can see it here. We don't know where, Bethany's about two miles from Jerusalem on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. We don't know where Bethpage is. It's thought that Bethpage is closer to Jerusalem than Bethany, but we don't know precisely where it is. Now, 
The Mount of Olives is this ridge that runs just east of Jerusalem, and it's about 100 feet higher than Jerusalem. And so there, he's there, and he comes there. It's that, that north-south ridge there. And Bethany, of course, that's the home of Mary and Martha. And the location, I said, Bethpage, we don't really know where that is. But we know from John chapter 12 that Jesus arrived in Bethany real late on Friday, right as the Sabbath was about to begin. So he arrives there, and he attends a dinner in his honor with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, Mark doesn't report that event, okay? I mean, that's just how the Gospels are. They have different interests, different access to things. He doesn't report that event. Rather, his focus is on Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem, and the preparation for which was his sending out two disciples to a nearby village to procure a colt, a young animal. In this case, it's a young donkey on which no one had ever sat. Now, I think that's, that's interesting, you see. Transporting the Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem as the climax of his ministry was a mission too great for a donkey that had been shared by anyone else. You see, it was just, it's just too great for, for anyone else to have sat on that donkey, for that donkey to be the one that escorts the Lord into Jerusalem. And so this donkey is one on which no one had ever sat. And Jesus probably gave those instructions about going into that neighboring village. He probably gave those when he arrived in Bethany. But it being understood, the Sabbath is imminent. And of course, you're not going to travel on the Sabbath. So it was understood that they would take care of that when they first could, which would be first light on Sunday. And so that would have been understood when they could carry out their assignment. And then in the morning, the morning hours of Sunday, the disciples go to the village. They untie the colt. Now, Matthew reports that there are two animals. One would have been the mother, you see. He just is reporting about the colt on which the Lord will ride. The colt that, on which no one has ever sat. So they go, to, they go to the village. They untie the colt. And as Jesus anticipated, some people ask, well, what are you doing? And they answer just as the Lord had instructed them, saying, the Lord has need of it, and he'll send it back here immediately. And the people let him take it. Now, it's possible that the Lord had prearranged the use of the colt, but that doesn't seem to me to be the way Mark is doing the story, you see. Mark's reporting suggests and how he reports the authority and the insight of Jesus and all that he's saying about Jesus, it suggests that Jesus foresaw the situation. He foresaw the situation and he knew they would accept his request. So that's the way, I, that's how Mark feels to me, is that's what he's saying. Now Jesus enters Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives riding on this young donkey. Now this is a deliberate fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 that Israel's future king would come riding on a young donkey. Now you have, you have to imagine the situation. All of the hubbub and the tumult and everything and the expectations here in first century Israel looking for this kingdom, all that Jesus had been saying, been doing, what he'd been saying, the kingdom is at hand, and then here he comes on this young donkey riding from the Mount of Olives coming into Jerusalem. Well, the crowd understood what was going on. They understood the symbolism. And you see the people, they're throwing their, their cloaks into the path, and they're cutting branches we're not talking about like tree branches that are an obstruction. You see, in fact, in John chapter 12, verse 13, we knew that the branches they cut, they at least included palm branches. Flat kind of things. You see, hence Palm Sunday. So here, there, but they're throwing their cloaks down and they're cutting branches and putting them in his path to create a kind of royal red carpet 
You see, that's what this is. It's kind of a way of saying, here, I'm putting these things here for you to walk on with, your, with the donkey. You see, it's an honor. It's an, it's an indication, their awareness of what's going on. And they celebrate him as the Davidic king. They celebrate him as the son of David entering into Jerusalem. Now, this is where in other Gospels, the Pharisees tell Jesus to rebuke the crowds. For their dangerous and their inappropriate words. But Jesus quotes Psalm chapter 8 verse 2. He quotes it from the Septuagint. And he quotes that which refers to the children praising God himself. In Matthew 21, 16. Not all the English translations bring out that, that element. But he quotes from the Septuagint where it says that God has ordained praise for himself. Well, that's a pretty clear indication of how Jesus understands who he is. And so he, he does that. And he declares in Luke 19.40 that if they were silent, the stones would cry out. Now look at that. I mean, you know, look. will you shut them up? Don't you know what terrible false things they're saying? Improper, inappropriate, and all that. And he says, hey, if I did silence them, the rocks would cry out. Ah. Oh. Man, and here he is. He's coming. Our Lord is coming to do what he came to do. He's coming to save the world. Now, Jesus, here he visits the temple complex, and he checks it out. He goes and, you know, scopes it. But because it's already late, it's late in the day, he then returns with the twelve to Bethany. So this first day, this is Sunday, he comes in. He enters Jerusalem on the young donkey. People understand. He goes to the temple. He scopes it out. It's late. And then he returns to Bethany. That's where he's staying. Now, as Jesus and the disciples return to Jerusalem the next morning. Now, it's Monday. They return the next morning. Jesus is hungry. And he sees in a distance a fig tree with leaves. And he goes to see if he could find something on it to eat. He doesn't go looking for figs. It's not fig season. He goes looking for something on it to eat, presumably hoping to find these edible buds that appeared prior to fig season. You see, presumably hoping to find those, the presence of which would be suggested by the fact there were leaves. Let me read to you what James Edwards says in his commentary. He says, After the fig harvest, from mid-August to mid-October, that's when the fig harvest is, the branches of fig trees sprout buds that remain undeveloped throughout the winter. These buds swell into small green knobs known in Hebrew as pagim in March to April, followed shortly by the sprouting of leaf buds on the same branches, usually in April. The fig tree thus produces fig knops before it produces leaves. Once a fig tree is in leaf, one therefore expects to find branches loaded with pagim, these edible knops that are not yet figs. Okay? Loaded with pagim in various stages of maturation. This is implied in 11.13 where Jesus, seeing a fig tree in full foliage, turns aside in hopes of finding something edible. In the spring of the year, the pagim are of course not yet ripened into mature summer figs, but they can be eaten and often are by natives. So this is what I think Jesus is seeing. He's hungry. He sees a fig tree in leaf. It is not fig season, but he's looking for something to eat He's looking for these knops, these edible buds. He's looking for these pagim. Now, despite the fact that this fig tree is in leaf, Jesus finds no pagim. He finds no edible knops, which you would expect on a fig tree that is in leaf. Because the knops are there and they grow before the leaf. So certainly when the fig tree is in leaf, I know I'm, going to, I'm not going to find figs. It's not fig season. But I will find 
these things I can eat. And he goes there and he finds what? Only leaves. He finds only leaves. Now, part of the difficulty, I think, to me, I think we've had trouble seeing what's going on here. And part of that is the placement of that, that final clause where it says, for it was not the time of figs. You see, I think that that clause is best understood, you see, as relating not to the immediately preceding clause, but back to the earlier clause, relating back to that earlier statement of Jesus. You see, he's looking for anything to eat. Why is he just looking for anything? Because it's not the season for figs. And you say, okay, that would make sense, but why do you think that something over here could hop over the immediately preceding clause and not relate to that and relate to something earlier? Well, is that even grammatically possible? It is. It is. You see an example of it in Mark 16, 3 and 4, which says, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us? Well, why are they concerned about the ability to roll away the stone? They're concerned because the stone's very large. But you see where that clause appears. It says, and looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. Well, did they see it was rolled back because it was large? No. They saw it rolled back because they saw it out of position. For it was very large relates back to who will roll away the stone. It's too big for us. All right, so it's possible for these things to be located like that. And I think that's what's happening here. Is that this is, this is where, that's where that is located. Now, understood this way, that I'm suggesting to you, understood this way, as Edward says, the tree in verse 13 turns out to be deceptive. You see, for it is green in foliage, but when Jesus inspects it, he finds no pagine. It is a tree with signs of fruit, but no fruit. Now that's very important, you see. That's very important. Jesus curses the fig tree. And I've heard people complain, oh, Jesus is such a terrible person. He curses this poor tree. Okay, but Jesus curses the fig tree as a kind of acted out parable of judgment on Israel for its refusal to give him what he had a right to expect. That's what this is. This is an acted out parable of judgment on Israel. You see, if a fig tree was often used in the Old Testament as a symbol of Israel. That's a common symbol for Israel. He's cursing the fig tree. And he's cursing it as a symbol of judgment on Israel for not giving him what he had a right to expect. And that symbolism is borne out by the fact that the upcoming cleansing of the temple, it's sandwiched between. He curses the fig tree, he cleanses the temple, and then we have the cursing of the fig tree story completed by the discovery of the fig tree being withered to the roots. And do you remember me telling you earlier on this, this technique called intercalation? Where you sandwich a story and you put something in between it and that they all connect? Well, that's the idea. They are all indicators of the judgment on Israel for rejecting God's deliverer. For rejecting God's Messiah. And that's what's being done here with this cursing of the fig tree. Now, inside the city... Inside the city, Jesus goes straight for the temple. He'd already been there before, right? He was there yesterday scoping it out. But he goes straight for the temple knowing full well from his prior visit what he's going to find there. And consumed with holy zeal. See, he's not blowing his stack. He's not sinfully angry. He's never sinful. Right? Never sinful. But with holy zeal and with righteous indignation, he turns over the tables of the money changers. You see, those who were for a fee, they would exchange your currency into the Tyrian shekels that were needed to pay the temple tax. 
It's like anything else. You're going somewhere. You need to have the money that's suitable for a local place. You can convert the money that you have into what's necessary in the country you're going, and there'll be a fee. You see? Sure, you give me this much money. It's the exchange rate. Right? I'm taking something. And so this is what they're doing. They are willing, the money changers will give you the Tyrian shekels that you need to pay the temple tax. But of course, I'm going to make something off it. And so you have that going on. And then you have, and then you have the, he chases out the merchants who are selling the sacrificial animals in the court of the Gentiles and their customers. So you can see, right, this has become a place of commerce. I know that people are going to want sacrifices. I know they're going to want shekels to pay the temple tax. So where am I setting up business? I'm coming right into the temple. Come on over here. Get my animal. I'll sell it to you. I got a great price. Come over here. No, no, I, I can undercut this guy. And Jesus comes into this place and just throws the tables over. You just think of this. I mean, can, you, can you see the scene? Do you see the courage? Do you see the power? That he comes in here. He, you know, and the image that's given of Jesus in our culture all the time is that Jesus is always like this. I don't want to say anything to anybody because it might be perceived as unloving. I mean, look, the Lord is somebody who is righteous and holy. And in the face of this kind of wrongdoing, the Lord is not timid. And he comes and overturns these, these tables and they wind up, chases them out. And this is an absolutely stunning rebuke of the Jewish leaders who had accepted this. Right? I mean, this is going on out in the open and they were fine with it. And so do you see the rebuke? That here they are saying, this is perfectly fine. This is how we run the temple. Yes, 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 it's fine. It's good. We find that it's a nice convenience. And then in comes this guy and he's throwing over everything and telling the people, get out! How dare you treat the temple this way? Well, that's a pretty big rebuke for the people who were letting them do that. Right? That's a pretty big rebuke. rebuke. They turn in the worship into a means of financial gain, no doubt, at the expense of the poor. And they're doing that. Well, this just further seals his death sentence. You know how people are? You know how chapped these people would be? How you've insulted us and made us look bad? And so, we're going to take him out. This flesh is coming. And so he further seals his death sentence. And when evening comes, he and his disciples, they again leave the city, presumably return back to Bethany where they've been staying. And then early the next morning, which is now Tuesday, they're, as they're returning to Jerusalem, they pass the fig tree that Jesus cursed, and they see that it had withered away at its roots. It was dead. You see, there's this is a completely dead fig tree. And Peter points that out to Jesus, and there's a degree of amazement that is implied. Whoa, look at that. That tree that you cursed, man, that thing's gone. And in reply, this to me is interesting. In reply, Jesus calls them to have faith in God. You're going, wait a minute. You curse this fig tree. We discover this cursing of this fig tree. And your response is, have faith in God. And what I think is going on, presumably he says this because Israel's rejection, Israel's rejection as symbolized by the cursed fig tree and the cleansing of the temple and epitomized by the coming destruction of the temple. Well, that rejection will expose the foolishness of a faith that's placed in the trappings of of the Jewish cult, a faith that's unduly wed to old covenant shadows. As David Garland says, most Jews regarded the temple as the place where prayer was particularly effective. 
You see, that, that was the idea, you see, that this is tied up in the Jewish worship rituals and the Jewish cult, particularly the temple. So the temple's destruction, you see how that could lead to doubts about the efficacy of prayer in the temple's absence. So wait a minute, wait a minute. This temple is key. This Jewish cult is key to your hearing our prayers. Now you're cursing the nation of Israel. You're coming in and showing that with the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. Now what effect is that going to have then? Are you abandoning us? And that's why I think he says, have faith in God. The truth is that God is the object of faith. And he will continue to grant prayers of faith without regard to the temple or without regard to Israel's national favor. God will continue to do this. And that's why I think he emphasized the certainty of God's granting prayers of faith. And he doesn't pause there to add the understood qualifications like you find elsewhere in accordance with his will and all that. He's not going here to list those things because that would blunt the point that Israel's rejection will create no disadvantage regarding prayer. And then in verse 25, he tells them as he does elsewhere, they must forgive others so that the Father will forgive them. And in verse 26, is, I don't know how your Bible is, it may be absent, maybe in brackets, but verse 26 where it says, but if you don't forgive, neither will your Father who's in heaven forgive your transgression. That's not part of Mark's original text. And so that's why it's either left blank or put in brackets. Now Jesus in, in 27 to 33, he returns, this is Tuesday, so he returned to the temple. And here you see the chief priests, the scribes and the elders, they immediately confronted him. And they demanded to know by what authority he had ejected people from the temple the day before. They ran the temple. Who in the world are you? Well, you tell us. This is our jurisdiction. We are the proper people to set policy in the temple. And then you come in as this lone wolf acting like you have some kind of authority. By what authority did you do that? And they're not happy, by the way. I can see it in their faces. This isn't some calm little thing. Oh, by the way, I was wondering, uh, can you... No. They're chapped. And they're getting in his face. And they want to know by what authority... He did what he had done. You see, they had the authority. Now, Jesus tells them, look, so they ask him a question. Jesus says, all right, look, I'll answer your question if you'll answer mine. That seemed pretty good. That seems reasonable, fair. You expect an answer from me? Okay, I'll give it. But you answer my question first. He says, John's baptism. Was it from heaven? Meaning, was it God's work? Was he God's agent? Or was it from man? Was it just made up by people? Was it divine? Or was it just something people had decided to do? Now that's more related to their question to him than you might think. As John Nolan says in his commentary, he says, The leaders have questions about Jesus' authority precisely because they've never actually faced up to the challenge of John's message. Well, John's message is what? Hey, I'm the forerunner of him. I'm the herald of him. Well, they never owned up to that. You see, so it's really connected. They say, what is your authority to do these things? He says, okay, you tell me. John's message John, what, what, was it from heaven? Is John's ministry from heaven or is it from man? His baptism, from heaven or from man? And they refused to answer. And they refused to answer because they're going to be in trouble however they respond. 
Right? If they say John's baptism was from heaven, in other words, he was God's agent. He was speaking on God's behalf. God was working in John. Then the inevitable follow-up will be, well, then why didn't you believe him? Right? You've just said he's, his ministry's of God. And yet, what did he say? This guy. Okay? Well, if they say that his ministry was of men, well, then what's the problem? Well, the people held John to be a prophet. And so now you're trashing their prophet. You're saying, no, he was a liar. He wasn't really a prophet. And so then the people will really be upset with them. And they, like politicians, don't like people upset with them. And so they refuse to answer. And Jesus says, okay. <laughs> I'm not answering either. So every time they try to jump on Jesus, it doesn't work out for them. And so he tells them that, that he's not going, so he just, he, you know, they wind up saying, listen, uh, we're not going to answer, so Jesus likewise refuses to answer their question. Then in chapter 12, 1 to 12, he tells them here that the parable of the wicked tenants. Now look at what's going on here. Look at these people and just look at the courage of Jesus to confront the hostile world. He doesn't sit here and just, you know, backtrack and weasel and say, well, if you're going to be upset by what I say, I think I won't tell you the truth. I'd rather have you suffer than to have me feel bad that you're angry with me. He doesn't do that. He tells them this parable of the vineyard. Now, the vineyard was an Old Testament image for Israel. And the fact that the language in this parable, it parallels Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, that supports the conclusion that the vineyard imagery in the parable is also being used for Israel. So that's what he's talking about. See, those tending the vineyard, that's Israel's leaders. Those who are tending the vineyard, they'd failed to produce from Israel the fruit of righteousness that God was due. Right, here you are, you're tending the vineyard, you are tending Israel, you are Israel's leader, and they had failed to produce from Israel the fruit of righteousness that God was due. And God had repeatedly sent prophets to them to urge the people to be faithful to the covenant. To be faithful to the covenant. To give him his due. To give him what he had a right to. But the leaders treated those prophets shamefully. And you see this in the Old Testament. They're in control and God sends a prophet. And how do they often treat the prophet? Well, you know, we don't like what you're saying. Get into this pit or... Do this or that. So this is how they treated him. Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see that, for example, in Matthew 15, 21 to 24. He was the son coming after many prophets. He's the son coming after many prophets, calling Israel again to repent, this time in light of the kingdom's arrival. And he's calling Israel to repent. He came blaming, bringing the, the blessings of the kingdom, the receipt of which, it requires faith in him as the Messiah, which faith includes a genuine commitment to holy living. So he comes with that, and rather than accept Jesus as the master's son, as the one who comes in the fullness of the master's authority... Rather than accept him that way, the religious leaders are challenging his authority. Where are you coming up with this? How can you do this? They're challenging his authority and ultimately they will kill him. As the tenants in the parable kill the master's son. And after telling that the, that the tenants kill the master's son, Jesus asked in verse 9, What will the owner of the vineyard do? And the answer is that he will come and destroy the tenants 
and give the vineyard to others. David Wenham, in his book, The Parables of Jesus, he says, the parable is thus an indictment of the political and religious leadership of the vineyard, but also a warning that the people whom they represent will come under divine judgment. The parable could be read as a warning only to the current leaders of the Jews that they would be displaced, rather than as a warning of judgment on the nation of Israel as a whole. But it's clear from Jesus' teaching elsewhere that Jerusalem and the Jewish nation as a whole face judgment, and that although the opposition to Jesus in the nation is not universal, see the disciples, the whole nation is implicated in the actions of its leaders. You see, the whole nation is implicated. Jesus then brings this point home by citing Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. You see, the rejected one, Jesus the rejected one becomes the preeminent one by the will of God. And here's what the Wenham says. The saying about the stone supplements the parable and in a sense completes it since the one rejected and killed, as the parable describes, was in due course to be the risen Lord and the cornerstone and the saved people of God. We've commented before on the limitations of parables and Jesus' parable of the vineyard is limited precisely in the fact that it leaves the son dead. To have had the son of the story rise from the dead would have altered the character of the parable as a picture taken from everyday life. So in using the stone saying, Jesus, who regularly spoke of his death and resurrection together, supplements the parable of the vineyard with another parable of resurrection as we may regard it. You see, so this is the stone the builders rejected. It has become the capstone. So ethnic Israel, ethnic Israel, as led and represented by Christ rejectors. Okay? Ethnic Israel as led and represented by Christ rejectors, which describes the nation proper at that time. You see, it forfeits the kingdom blessings it was to enjoy. But ethnic Israel as represented by the apostles who are Jews, right? You see, ethnic Israel as represented by this minority over here, represented by the apostles of Christ, receives the blessing of the kingdom along with later Gentiles of like faith who will be grafted into the new Israel. You see, so we have Israel... Ethnic Israel, we have true Israel, which is the Israel that shares the faith of Abraham, and then we have new Israel, which is true Israel into which the Gentiles have been grafted. So this is what he's saying, that you are going to forfeit the nation as led by and represented by Christ rejectors, which was the nation of that time, you will lose. But ethnic Israel as represented and led by the apostles, those who have the faith of Abraham, those who believe what God has said about his son, they will then receive the blessings of the kingdom. You see, it is this holy nation, this holy nation that will receive the glory of being God's vehicle for blessing the world. That's Matthew 28. We are the ones who receive that. I heard that bell, but let me give you this. This resonates with, his, with Jesus' lament. I heard that bell. Let me just read this. In 23, 37, and 38, where he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. That's exactly what he's saying. You see, because you rejected me, it was for you, because you rejected me, you were out. And who's in? Ethnic Israel as led by the apostles with the Gentiles grafted in. We have the honor. We have the honor of being God's 
people and God's message to the world that is in us. That's ours. Okay, I heard that bell. Thanks for coming.